So those are your three choices. Uh, first of all, why? the question overall is why are you joining today's webinar? And the three choices are, first, I am new to wildlife trafficking and would like to find out more information. Second, I would like to take action against wildlife trafficking. And third, I or my company is already taking action to combat wildlife trafficking. Please take a moment and complete our poll. For those of you who are joining us uh, in Spanish or Portuguese, there are uh, interpretation uh, services available for you. I'm gonna go over how to do that in just a second, but keep answering the polling question while I do that. Uh, as I said, the webinar is available in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. Uh, to listen to the webinar in your preferred language, please select the language from the interpretation tab on the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you're dialing in on a computer, that toolbar will be at the bottom. Sometimes in some mobile applications, it might be at the top. So look for it in either location, but you should see this interpretation icon. You will be able to click on that. And then once you have selected your preferred language, uh, kindly mute the original audio to hear only your preferred language. So please select English, Spanish, or Portuguese and mute the original channel, uh, so the original audio so that you don't hear both uh, and, and get confused. For example, if you wanna to listen to Spanish, select Spanish from the interpretation tab, then mute the original audio. Uh, many of you have already taken our polling question. We really appreciate that. Please, uh, we're gonna get started here in about one, one, maybe like 30 seconds. Uh, I see that there's a few of you who have just joined our, our webinar today, but take a moment and um, answer our polling question. Uh, why are you joining today's webinar? Your first choice, I am new to wildlife trafficking and would like to find out more information. Your second choice, I would like to take action against wildlife trafficking. Or your third choice, I or my company is already taking action to combat wildlife trafficking. Again, you've joined our webinar on wildlife trafficking in Latin America and the Caribbean. It's produced by ACI International, Airports Council International World and Airports Council International Caribbean. Uh, as well as the International Air Transportation Association, IATA. Uh, and we are so grateful to all three of them for their help in producing today's webinar. And on behalf of them, I would like to thank the U.S. Agency for International Development for the funding that has helped to provide for this webinar and many other actions to help combat tra wildlife trafficking, both in the region and around the world. I'm Richard Crispine. I'm the CEO of Collaborate Up. I'm also the facilitator of the Routes Partnership, and it's my pleasure and honor to be with you today moderating this webinar on wildlife trafficking in Latin America and the Caribbean. I do just wanna go over a few more logistical items before we dive right in here. Keep filling out that poll if you haven't already. Um, for, uh, hopefully you've selected the correct language for yourself so that you know where to uh, hear the audio for today's webinar. If we can go to the next slide, please, uh, Francisco. Um, to comment or to ask a question, uh, you can put that into the Q and A uh, tab, which again should be at the wherever you found the interpretation. Uh, you should find the Q and A button, and down there uh, you can bring up a window, and in there you can input your question. Feel free to do that in Spanish, English, or Portuguese. And really, I want to encourage you to not be shy because today's webinar we have some great content for you. We've got some great speakers, but today's webinar is your webinar. We want to make sure that we get to your questions, your issues. And the only way we can do that is if you play along. So please, uh, as questions are occurring to you or comments are occurring to you, don't hold back, put them in the, in the Q&A box. We'll get to as many as we possibly can. Um, and uh, as I said, keep those coming and you can put them in in either Spanish or in English and they, they will be interpreted uh, for our panelists today. Uh, with that, again, I just wanna say, I'm Richard Crispin, the moderator for today's panel on wildlife trafficking in Latin America and the Caribbean. And it's my real uh, hope that from today's uh, discussion that you will come away with a greater understanding of the state of wildlife trafficking in Latin America and the Caribbean and its intersection with airports and air transportation. Uh, today we'll be a, as interactive as we possibly can. So please don't forget to put in your questions so that we can get to as many as we can. But with that, I wanna introduce to you a, a great colleague and friend, Michelle Owen, uh, Francisco, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, Michelle is a, uh, a true, Michelle, you are a true thought leader on the topic of international wildlife crime. And uh, you have been the route's lead and one of its uh, animating forces over its almost five years of success, dragging progress, combating wildlife trafficking uh, around the globe. And with that, Michelle, I wanna turn it over to you. 
Thank you, Richard, uh, and thanks for the kind words. Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on wildlife trafficking in aviation. Um, as Richard mentioned, I'm very grateful to IATA and ACI for working together to, to host this webinar and the support from the US government to enable it to happen. Um, we've got some great panelists coming up uh, that are representing both the Rights Partnership and their own organisations. Um, for me, I'm just going to very quickly uh, introduce everybody to, to wildlife trade and what that actually means uh, for the aviation industry. Um, so I think we have to recognise, first of all, that there is legal wildlife trade, and that's worth approximately 350 billion US dollars a year. It includes the sale and exchange of natural products for food, fashion, furniture, and medicine, and so on. The trade is subject to national laws and international regulations, including the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, commonly referred to as CITES, which aims to ensure that international trade does not threaten the survival of wild animals and plants. International regulations through CITES apply to around 35,000 species. There are currently 183 parties to this legally binding convention. There are also additional types and numbers of species that are protected by national legislation and which vary from country to country. The illegal trade of wildlife, including animals and plants, avoids compliance with the legal requirements for trade. and It will exploit legal transportation systems to move illicit goods. The USA Browse Partnership, which includes ACI, IATA and NGOs and government agencies, are working together to try and reduce the exploitation of the legal aviation supply chain by wildlife traffickers by building awareness, support and the resources to respond to this transnational crime. The illegal wildlife trade is one of the top four criminal markets with an annual estimated value of seven to $23 billion, excluding timber. Due to the nature of illicit activities, it's very hard to know the true cost of the value of the market as estimates are based on what is seized and these are likely to be an underrepresentation. These figures also do not take into account the costs and impact to local and national economies, national stability, or the risk to biodiversity and environmental health. However, understanding or knowing how wildlife trafficking affects the air industry, how it is conducted, the routes and methods used are essential for the industry to make informed decisions on risk assessments and policy or operational responses. The illegal wildlife trade has direct impacts on biodiversity and environmental health and puts pressure on already vulnerable species. Threatening and armed poachers bring instability to a region and often operate in sensitive border regions and have resulted in the loss of over a thousand park ranges in the past decade. The illegal trade also damages tourism, a vital source of income for many countries, and local communities and travel providers. Tourists avoid unstable regions and those who travel to view the natural environment and wildlife are more likely to stay away. The lower risks of capture and penalties associated with, wild, with wildlife trafficking also provide opportunities for organised crime and corruption to be encouraged. At a more extreme level, the impact and involvement of organised criminals can be seen in cases such as this example, where the international trafficking of the totoaba fish is carried out by Mexican drug cartels. And the fight to control this trade has led to murder. This type of trade depends heavily on bribery, corruption, fraud, money laundering and intimidation. It is also likely that the means used for trafficking the totoaba, including the flight routes and points of corruption, will be used to traffic other illicit goods. Next slide. The illegal trade poses a number of business risks to the aviation industry, including the loss of reputation and revenue due to wildlife trafficking cases associated with corruption or poor management within the industry, lost revenue due to inadequate or failed procedures that enable or are susceptible to corruption, breach of legal requirements and potential prosecution, health and safety concerns resulting in delays, increased insurance rates, or increased government scrutiny. 
Next slide. More recently, the COVID pandemic has brought awareness of zoonotic disease to the forefront of people's attention. But it should not be forgotten that avian influenza, Ebola, SARS, Nipah and Hendra viruses all caused epidemics and are still resulting in localised outbreaks even today and causing operational and financial disruption to the aviation industry. We should also not forget that the potential risk of a pandemic has been highlighted for decades and with the increased degradation of habitats as well as increased trade in wildlife, both legal and illegal, there are concerns that the likelihood of zoonotic disease spillover will increase and will be more severe. Wildlife traffickers do not comply with the live animal regulations and increase the risk posed to health through subversion of health controls and the promotion of conditions that exacerbate disease transfer. I hope this webinar will provide you with the information on the potential exposure of your companies to the risk from wildlife trafficking. And with that in mind, I'd like to pass over to a very good colleague from c ads Bridget. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, um, ACI and IATA, for putting together this webinar. Um, let me tell you first a little about my company, c 4 ads we are a DC-based nonprofit that conducts investigations into transnational illicit activity. Our environmental crimes team, my team's uh, mandate, is to support enforcement authority and compliance action against transnational criminal organizations trafficking in illicit wildlife or wildlife products. Uh, to do this, uh, next slide, please. To do this, we work with dozens of organizations to provide data analysis and training on counter wildlife trafficking techniques. In its role uh, as manager of data and analytics for the USAID Roots Partnership, c 4 ads maintains a global database of seizures of wildlife or wildlife products along air routes. The database covers publicly reported seizures of animal species and includes information such as trafficking date, route, product, obfuscation, and detection. Next slide, please. It's from this uh, database that I'll be talking through some trends about wildlife trafficking in the Latin America and Caribbean region. So to capture the information collected in the database, we collect data from reporting in customs press releases, local news reports, CITES annual reports, and more. It is important to note that analyzing wildlife trafficking activity using open source seizure data is subject to certain limitations. First of all, the accuracy of the data is heavily dependent on the data source and can be affected by differences in reporting from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Additionally, seizures only capture unsuccessful smuggling attempts and could be evidence of effective enforcement efforts rather than just high volumes of trafficking, trafficking activity. Because of this, the database is not met, meant to represent the entirety of wildlife trafficking activity through the air transport sector, but is intended to showcase the patterns visible from within the data. Regardless of the challenges of using uh, seizure data to understand wildlife trafficking, it remains a helpful and common proxy to study the routes and methods of traffickers. Next slide, please. So let me talk more specifically about what we can learn from the air seizure database about wildlife trafficking in the Latin America and Caribbean region. But first, um, let's have a poll about what you consider the most trafficked species. So while um, you're considering this polling question, I also wanna share with you the results of our first polling question, which I forgot to do earlier and I apologize. Um, so uh, in answer to the question, why are you joining today? 39% uh, of you said that you were new to wildlife trafficking and wanted to get more information. 24% said that you wanted to take action uh, on illegal wildlife trade, and 37% uh, of you said you were already taking action. So about a third, a third, and a third, a very evenly split. So it's wonderful to have such a diverse audience with us today. Please do answer this question uh, based on C4ADS Air Seizure Database. What do you think was the most trafficked species in the Latin America and Caribbean region? Uh, your choices are mammals, birds, reptiles, or marine animals. Again, your first choice is mammals, second choice is birds, third choice is reptiles, fourth choice is marine animals. 
I'm repeating those questions uh, in English so that our interpreters can catch up with us so that you hear uh, hopefully the question based on C4ADS air seizure database, what was the most trafficked species in the LAC region, as well as the choices, mammals, birds, reptiles, or marine animals. I think it looks like a few more of you are still voting. I'm gonna give it like maybe five more seconds here. So get those final votes in. Oh, a rush of people are voting right here at the end. We'll hold it open for another five seconds. Yeah, keep those votes coming. Okay, Francisco, I think you can go ahead and close the poll. And it looks like the winner there is birds. Uh, Bridget, can you want to tell us the real answer? What is the real answer to that? So as I'll talk about in a little more detail later, in 2020, reptiles were actually the most trafficked species in the LAC region in 2020. Um, but birds, as most people uh, know, are also very commonly trafficked within the region. Um, first, I'll talk generally uh, about the impacts of wildlife trade in the LAC region, though. Um, as Michelle mentioned, it has far-reaching impacts on public health, security, and tourism. Um, and in the LAC region, these impacts are very clear. In terms of public health, for example, wildlife trafficking, live wildlife trafficking, has been shown to have potential to spread zoonotic disease. In the LAC region, 40% of seizures contain live animals, which is the highest rate of live animal trafficking of any region in the world. In terms of security, it has been reported that wildlife trafficking can suggest the presence of other illicit activities exploiting the same route or hub. And in the LAC region, um, there has been both proven organization level convergence of say, Mexican drug cartels involved in the Totoaba trade and seizure level convergence of, for example, jaguar teeth and gold smuggling happening together. And finally, in terms of tourism, the Living Planet Index recorded a 94% drop in animal population sizes in the LAC region from 1970 to 2020. And this decline is due to many factors, but possibly including wildlife trafficking of the unique species in the LAC region. More unique species were trafficked in this region than in Africa from 2010 to 2020. Uh, next slide. So now I'll get into a little more specifics about the um, what the common species trafficked are, how they're moving the products, and where wildlife is occurring. Um, but first here, I'll um, talk about uh, finch trafficking. So as many people in the poll suggested, birds are very commonly trafficked within the LAC region. In this June 2019 seizure of 34 finches hidden in hair crawlers, um, for example, shows a common route from Georgetown, Guyana to New York, New York City in the United States. Um, finches have become prized songbirds for competitions in the United States. And although pet finches could be sent legally, wild finches are considered better, better singers in these competitions and smuggling the birds circumvents a mandatory month long quarantine process, which of course leads to risks such as the spread of disease and significant public health concerns. Next slide, please. So that route from Georgetown, Guyana to New York City, United States is the most common city to city route in the database. But looking more generally, um, uh, based on the um, data collected in the air seizure database, traffickers exploited 91 airports globally to move products that came from within the LAC region including 61 airports in the region itself from 2010 to 2020. And the most commonly exported airports are those in Mexico City, Sao Paulo, Bellum, Manaus, and Tijuana. These five airports account for 30% of wildlife trafficking in the LAC region. Um, Intra-regional demand is also an important factor of wildlife trafficking in the air transport sector in the LAC region. Um, of the 17 countries that were involved in wildlife trafficking in the region, 14 received wildlife either domestically or regionally. While this rate of intra-regional trafficking is not as high as it is in Asia, for example, it is still significant. And Brazil and Mexico are the largest drivers of this demand from within the LAC region. 
They both routinely act as origin and destination points for wildlife products. And next slide. Yeah. So as we saw before, um, in 2020, reptiles were actually the most commonly trafficked animal in the region, and they made up 41% of seizures in, that, in last year. But birds, reptiles, and marine species are all commonly trafficked at, um, or commonly seized at airports, according to the air seizure database. And the top species include finches, lizards, snakes, turtles, and fish. Reports by organizations such as Traffic and IUCN show that mammal trafficking, particularly of jaguars or their derivative parts, is also a significant concern in the region. Uh, mammal trafficking appears to use other methods of transport and is less prevalent in the air seizure database than the other categories. However, it is possible that mammals too are commonly trafficked in the air transport sector and are just not commonly seized or reported on. Uh, next slide. So one of the most commonly trafficked species were turtles. Like in this May 2020 seizure of over 15,000 turtles packaged in boxes being shipped from Mexico City to China. Um, although many shipments, many turtle shipments were seized within the LAC region, the largest shipments of turtles are usually destined for China or Japan. This particular shipment held freshwater turtles, which are among the most endangered vertebrates in the world. Turtles are popular in Asia both to keep as pets and for human consumption. As pets, turtles are prized for their longevity, and some estimates um, indicate turtles can be worth around 300 US dollars each. So now I've talked about kind of where and what traffickers are smuggling, but how about how they're moving the wildlife and wildlife products? Um, next slide. So as this table shows here of animal method type destination, um, how traffickers move their product depends largely on the end uses of the live wildlife or wildlife products. Um, and I'm gonna walk through some common smuggling techniques for the three main species in the LAC region, which are birds, reptiles, and marine species. So birds, for example, are often trafficked to be kept as pets. And so are trafficked live 74% of the time. They're hidden in luggage or in a passenger's clothing 60% um, of the time possibly to ensure their survival or because their high market value makes it worth it to smuggle even a small number of the animals. Uh, reptiles are also often sought as, as pets and are trafficked live 50% of the time, according to um, the air seizure database. Reptiles are um, sought as pets for their unusual colors that might be passed down through breeding. And as with the case with the turtles in the last slide, most of the seizures containing the largest number of reptiles are bound for Asia, but Despite this, most reptile trafficking remains within the LAC region, and Mexico and Brazil in particular seem to have strong domestic markets for reptile pets. Um, unlike birds and reptiles, 72% uh, of marine species seizures contain processed wildlife products. The majority of marine species products recorded were totoaba bladders and shark fins. These are destined to be used in soups or as traditional medicines in China. Um, and they are most commonly smuggled in luggage or air freight, possibly due to the need because they do not need to be kept alive or because it's more valuable to send them in large numbers. Um, next slide, please. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, trafficking of marine species are often totoaba bladder or shark fin. Michelle and I both mentioned totoaba bladders earlier in reference to the security risks of wildlife trafficking, and Mexican narcotics traffickers have been reported to be involved in the totoaba trade. Um, but shark fins like this are also valuable. In this seizure from January 2020, 4,000 shark fins were sent from Mexico through Miami in the United States where they were seized. The final destination of these products was China. Um, shark fins are used in soup and considered a delicacy in China. So now, I've talked a bit about the what, where, and how of wildlife trafficking within the LAC region. Um, to learn what you're most interested in, and uh, we now have another poll.
while that while we're bringing up the next poll, um, I see that a number of you have um, a, a couple of you have put up uh, your hand. Um, we want to do as I said, we do want to get to as many questions as possible. Please put your uh, answer your questions into the Q and A tab, and we will get to those. Um, in the meantime, to the, the next poll is what type of information are you interested in learning more about? Uh, first choice is seizure statistics per species. Routes per country. Third choice is risks associated with specific routes. And fourth choice is detailed country level assessments. Again, the question, what type of information are you interested in learning more about? First choice, seizure statistics per species. Second choice, common trafficking routes per country. Third choice, risks associated with specific routes. And the fourth choice, detailed country level assessments. Please go ahead and fill out the poll. Um, while you're um, uh, doing that, as I said, please do, uh, if you have new questions coming in, um, please go ahead and uh, put those into the Q&A box and we will get to as many of those as we can. Um, and I know that uh, uh, at least a couple of those we will be for sure able to get to. And um, for our panelists, as you can see, I have, I, I know that I started speaking incredibly fast this morning. Uh, and I, 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 our other panelists, uh, Bridget and Michelle, have modeled good behavior here and slowed down for our interpreters. And I'm trying to do the same thing for our next uh, panel. Please do also slow down uh, your speech so that our interpreters can keep pace with you. Um, so again, our question was, what type of information are you most interested in learning more about? The number one answer, uh, Bridget, was common trafficking routes per country. Uh, a distant second, uh, kind of a tie for second, was risks associated with specific routes and detailed country level assessments. Um, I'm sure you have information to share with us about many of those topics. So Bridget, back over to you. I do, Richard, I do. Um, thank you everybody for your um, kind of poll results here, your answers here. Um, as we'll see on the next slide, you can do all of these things actually, and learn more about all of these things. The Routes Partnership has created the Routes Dashboard, which is housed at routes-dashboard.org and is built off the data in the air seizure database that I've been talking about. The, database, the dashboard has four main features, um, the analytics, route risk tool, country profile map, and country trafficking assessments. So the analytics page, is where you'd be able to generate insights like those I've just provided, seizure statistics per species, et cetera. You can find statistics, seizure numbers, common trafficking routes, and more. Then you can update filters based on region, species, year, or trafficking method, and update the statistics and graphics um, kind of generated through the site. And all graphics are downloadable from the site, ensuring you can use them widely and freely. The route risk tool um, addresses the common trafficking routes uh, per country or region here. So it allows you to examine risks associated with specific routes. You can choose a city, country, or regional level routes by navigating to drop down bars on the site. Once you've chosen a route, say Brazil to within the LAC region, you can read about the specific seizures recorded along that route and if it is more than a city to city level route, view the locations of the seizures along that route. So it seems like most people will be very interested in exploring the route risk tool. The country, country profile map is a third page that lets you navigate around a globe and choose individual countries to examine. Once you click on a country, a prop up will provide statistics about the seizures there, including trafficking instances and something called an enforce, country enforcement index which is a proxy for how effective enforcement has been in that country. And finally, you can read and download the 10 country profiles the Routes, Routes Partnership has developed. These profiles provide deep dives into specific countries and talk about the risks and methods unique to those countries. The dashboard is a unique resource for answering the questions about wildlife trafficking in the air transport sector most relevant to you. And I highly encourage you to go check it out. The partnership is also releasing a report on wildlife trafficking in the Latin America and Caribbean region in the com coming months, and which will go into more detail about everything I've talked about here. Um, Richard, if there have been any questions about anything I've talked about today, I'm happy to answer them. And if not, I'll hand it over to you to start our panel discussion. 
Terrific. Uh, thank you, Bridget. Uh, that was very insightful. We do have several questions that have come in. Um, first question is, will presentations be available? Uh, and the answer to that is yes. Afterwards, we will circulate uh, the presentations around. The next question, uh, Bridget, for you is, what is the most smuggled species in Guatemala? Do you know that? Um, you know, Richard, I do not know that off the top of my head, but I would be happy to look back into the data um, to get that answer. Um, I recommend or I encourage everybody to reach out um, to me with specific questions about data or go on the Roots dashboard website to um, kind of learn more. Uh, I don't have all the stats on the, off the top of my head, unfortunately. <laughs> For each country. Yeah, no, no, no worries. Um, the next question was, how can my company in South Africa assist in combating wildlife trade or the illegal wildlife trade? Uh, the answer there is to reach out to the route's partners, A ACI, IATA, Traffic, WWF, and we will share their contact information after today's webinar. Um, next question, uh, and this, this may not be a question for you, maybe a, a question for our panel. So let, let me know, Bridget. The question is, um, are there any CITES initiatives for remote training uh, for airport employees about this important matter. Um, and actually, I, I do happen to know the answer to that question, and it is that there is an e-module for airports under development as well as a handbook. Uh, both will be released in March. Um, and Juliana, in our upcoming panel, will talk more about actions airports can take. Um, last question for you uh, is, how, do, how, how, how does one get the dashboard? I'm not sure. I, I, I think I may have missed where to find it. Where, 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 where can people go to get the dashboard? Sure, yeah, it's um, a website that you can uh, type in routes-dashboard.org um, and the dashboard will be available to you there. Perfect. Um, and lastly, and, I, and oh, I should say that the, the link to that dashboard will be in the materials that we circulate um, afterwards. Um, and do you know, uh, a new question that just came in, uh, from Adriana at Aero Mexico. What is the relationship, if any, between wildlife trafficking and human trafficking? Do they share routes or risks? That's an interesting question. Within the air seizure database, we have not seen um, wildlife seizures or wildlife trafficking and human trafficking kind of happening at the same time. But we, um, the Routes Partnership, did just release a report or is currently releasing a report on. Um, and at the convergence of wildlife trafficking and other types of trafficking methods and that will talk more about kind of general convergence um, over hubs and transportation routes. Terrific. Well, thank you, Bridget. Um, now I want to turn to our panel discussion. So in today's webinar so far, you've gotten an introduction from Rochelle Owen to wildlife trade overall, uh, both in the region and globally. And then we really got a grounding in the data from Bridget, who really kind of dived in and helped us understand what's happening from a data perspective in Latin America and the Caribbean. And now I want to open it up. And if we could go, Francisco, to the next slide, please. I want to bring in uh, a discussion with panelists from WWF, IATA, ACI International, ACI World, and uh, USAID. Uh, and the panel, all of our panelists are members of the Routes Partnership. Uh, so if we can go ahead and start our panel discussion here. Uh, so I think, uh, uh, Francisco, you can take the slide down. Um, I'm really pleased to be joined by Corey McFarland, who is a Senior Corporate Engagement Officer with the World Wildlife Fund, John Godson, who is the Assistant Director for Environment at IATA, Juliana Scavuzzi, who is the Senior Director for Sustainability, Environmental Protection, and Legal Affairs at ACI, and Isabella Genta, who is the Environment and Natural Resources Officer uh, in the Foreign Service for the United States Agency for International Development. Uh, welcome, panelists. We're so glad to have all of you with us today. Uh, Corey, I want to start with you uh, there, WWF, and I know that you have been one of the founding members of the Routes Partnership. How does the Routes Partnership work with companies in the air transport sector? Sure. So Routes works with the air transport sector to reduce opportunities for wildlife to be trafficked through legal supply chains. The partners bring different expertise to support companies by providing data analytics. An example of that is through the data dashboard, which Bridges just shared. We also have regional and role specific trainings that can be integrated with a company's existing training platforms. 
We have aware awareness raising materials like posters and digital displays, as well as guidance and corporate support that can help airlines and airports show how their efforts to address wildlife trafficking support the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. And all of the route's materials were developed with the intention of being evergreen, meaning they are long lasting and will not require many updates to the content. And they are all in open files that can be easily adapted to fit the needs of each company. These materials can be found on the route's website, routespartnership.org, and are free to use and we, are, and we hope you will make use of them. And if you have any questions, we are available to help answer them. So it sounds like Routes really brings a lot of different kinds of support from training to materials to policies and processes uh, that airports and airlines can access through the Routes Partnership. Is that right, Corey? Yes, we definitely try to. That's our goal. <laughs> Terrific. Um, what other organizations do you work with to address wildlife trafficking beyond um, airports and, and, and uh, airlines? Sure. So Routes partners also work closely with United for Wildlife, an initiative led by the UK's Duke of Cambridge and the Royal Foundation. United for Wildlife has put forward the Buckingham Palace Declaration, which is a series of commitments aimed to support the private sector in their fight against wildlife trafficking. The materials Routes has developed can be used by companies in the air transport sector to help fulfill many of those commitments outlined in the Buckingham Palace Declaration. I also want to mention that for our participant who had asked about um, what they can be doing in South Africa, we also work with a number of regional associations in Southern Africa as well as um, Southeast Asia. So please feel free to reach out to us and we're happy to help um, support you. And then finally, so is that, go, yeah, I'm sorry? Please, please. No, please go ahead, please. Oh, sure. Um, just regardless of where you are on your journey to address wildlife trafficking, based on the poll, we have folks at different levels, whether you're right at the beginning and don't know where to start, or you're already implementing a few strategies but are looking for that next step, um, Routes is here to support you. This is a challenging global issue that requires a coordinated, concerted effort and with the support of the Routes partners, the IATA and ACI offices, as well as the extensive WWF network based in Latin America, we're here to help you join the effort to protect iconic species, conserve the environment, strengthen the integrity of your supply chains, and safeguard the health and safety of your staff and passengers by addressing wildlife trafficking. So it sounds like Routes, uh, the Routes partnership is a great it's sort of one-stop shop to uh, get introduced to the topic of wildlife trafficking and how uh, the air transportation industry might help. Uh, it also provides you with a lot of uh, backstop support if you sign public declarations like the Buckingham Palace Declaration or want to take other specific actions, uh, the Routes Partnership can be a real resource for you. Do, do I have that right, Corey? Yes, definitely. That's our goal, to be a one-stop shop and we can help make those connections that you need and we have a number of available resources on our website. Brilliant, thank you. Um, now I want to turn to Juliana with uh, ACI. Uh, Juliana, why, uh, why did you think ACI uh, decided to engage on this issue? What do you consider to be the key reasons for the aviation industry uh, to engage? First, Richard, let me thank you, but also let me thank uh, USAID that uh, makes everything we're doing today possible and also our partners. And it's really incredible to see 150 people register for this uh, webinar and we're talking about this important issue. So for us, I think uh, it's really about two main things. It is the right thing to do. And it's also we know that this sector has been exploited by traffickers. We have seen that in the excellent presentations that we have heard today. So protecting biodiversity and global health, uh, we also think that is the priority for this generation and we need to really focus on that. Personally speaking, I'm from Brazil originally, so I know about the beauty of the nature in the LAC region firsthand and I also know about the trust it is facing. So it's really important that we, we join efforts. And wildlife trafficking, we, we have learned that it can contribute, among other factors uh, like climate change and land use changes to the risk of zoonotic emergency. And aviation has been really hard impacted by this pandemic. So as we recover uh, as a sector, we must do it uh, building, a back, building back better and we must ensure a sustainable and resilient industry, also part as a sustainable and resilient uh, world. 
the current crisis has also highlighted the need to collaborate. We cannot do all those uh, things that we need to do to tackle um, uh, climate change and to address uh, biodiversity protections by ourselves. So we need to work together to increase resilience. And that means avoiding the risk in the first place, but also become more equipped to respond to those risks. Look into those risks uh, from a systemic approach into supply chains, into people, infrastructure operations, we think is the way forward. And we think that the aviation industry is perfectly placed to support fighting this crime. Mm. So I'm hearing from you, uh, the reason for, the, for getting involved is, A, it's the right thing to do, B, this is a real crisis uh, and something that needs to be addressed uh, immediately. Uh, you can't wait. But it's also something, thirdly, that we can't go alone on. We need a comprehensive, sy systemic approach to building more resilience uh, into, the, uh, into the overall system. Is that exactly. right? Yeah, and that's why this partnership is so important because it brings this different knowledge, you know, from private sector, but also from the conservation uh, organizations. And with the support of USAID, we've been able to actually develop so, so much uh, in this and with mm. this different uh, background. It, it's quite, quite special. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. Uh, John, John Godson from IATA, I want to pull you into the conversation here. Uh, I know that right now during this, uh, the economic shutdown that has occurred in, in the wake of COVID-19, many airlines are fighting for their lives right now. Uh, so has interest on the part of airlines in wildlife trafficking decreased because of the pandemic? And how can airlines help prevent future pandemics and build resilience into the system like uh, Juliana just referenced? Thanks for that, Richard. Firstly, I would like to echo Juliana's comments regarding uh, USAID. I think it's uh, the support has been vital, key to engaging uh, with the air transport sector, delivering real solutions that have a sensitivity and appreciation of the particular characteristics of, of air transport and the air transport industry. So in terms of um, um, interest in, in this issue regarding uh, during the pandemic, I think quite the reverse has been true. Um, COVID has demonstrated that our extreme vulnerability to pandemics. Science tells us that climate change, wildlife trafficking, mass travel and habitat loss will lead to increased pandemics in the future. Paradoxically, the increasingly interconnected world that has been created by aviation contributes to our own vulnerability. The links between wildlife trafficking and, and zoonotic disease spill over to humans have been recognized by many in the industry. And correspondingly, we've seen an increase in interest and participation in our activities related to IWT in the past few months. Thanks. Brilliant, thank you um, for that. And then if we could maybe get a little bit more specific now on how airlines and airports can play a role in preventing wildlife trafficking. I'd love to hear from both Juliana and John, but John, let me just stick with you. Um, what can airlines do right now? Or what do they do? I'm sorry, just unmuting myself. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the, the role that the airlines can play, um, we, we see that there's a work that could be supporting enforcement. This is principally our role here. We realize that it is not our duty to, uh, to arrest and to interdict seizures. We're there to support um, enforcement agencies. So back in, um, back in 2014, we formed a task force. Um, we thought that this actually was an issue that was related to only African species, illegal wildlife products such as rhino horn and ivory being transported uh, into Asia. But as we've heard now, this is a global issue and it's also widespread in the, in the LAC region. Um, so we feel that um, airlines can support with additional sources of human and digital intelligence. Um, uh, th th those two elements are the key ones. We can support enforcement. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, John. So um, again, not becoming enforcement, but uh, assisting enforcement with additional um, uh, intelligence, both human and, and data uh, that can assist law enforcement in, in doing their job. Um, Juliana, I'd like to bring you into the conversation here. Uh, what do you see as the role of airports and what are they doing to help assist uh, with enforcement? Sure, uh, Richard. Uh, I do see and we do understand that the role of airport uh, will highly depend on the governance framework of those airports and what uh, every stakeholder is responsible at on site the airport. 
And uh, we know that that varies among regions and countries. And with all those stakeholders acting on site the airport, collaboration, again, something that I mentioned before, among them is it's key to facilitate action. I also agree with John, uh, signing the Buckingham Palace, Palace Declaration, raising awareness to the issue, uh, also capacitating our professionals so they can detect uh, strange behaviors and encouraging a closer uh, collaboration of enforcement authorities are all common ground for all aviation stakeholders to focus on. We have also noticed that it's, it's quite a, a drive to action is to incorporate wildlife trafficking also prevention under the uh, sustainability umbrella of airports. Uh, we have, I think Corey mentioned, uh, the routes document that was developed that links uh, wildlife trafficking prevention with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, from our side, ACI Europe has also included uh, wildlife trafficking on their sustainability strategy. So they did that in the first version and this year they relaunched the second version and that's there as well. So it's kind of a guide to support airports how to uh, incorporate that uh, under the sustainability umbrellas. And of course, we're proud of our members that have taken a leadership <clears throat> role and we hope to continue uh, to encourage them and among among them uh, in this region I, I can name a few Galapagos, Bogota and, and Nassau but uh, we hope to see uh, many more coming in. Mm. You know I have a colleague who always reminds me that it is it is an amazing feat of engineering that an airplane is able to take off from one city and go to another but it's also an, an amazing feat of governance and legal frameworks that allows that to happen as well. So it sounds like through the routes partnership and through the work of ACI and IATA, you guys are doing a lot of work to put together the plumbing of all of these kinds of governance frameworks, legal frameworks, policy frameworks that are needed to make all this come together um, and to make sure that, that uh, what you're doing aligns with broader global agendas as well as with the needs and business needs of airlines and airports. Is, is that right? Yeah, exactly. Excellent, excellent. So with that, that really solid foundation that you've li laid, what is next? What is next for airlines and airports um, in the region? And maybe Juliana, I can stay with you and then John, I'll come over to you. Sure, Richard. Um, with the, the support that I have mentioned uh, from USAID and also uh, from our knowledge from our partners, we have been able to develop uh, airport specific material through the routes partnership. They're coming, they're almost uh, ready to be launched. Uh, we have a handbook and also a new model. But we also have, uh, don't want to spoil, we'll have a next webinar uh, on March 2nd and airports can learn more about those materials there. And uh, we have also our team, uh, which also make possible those webinars and our wildlife trafficking prevention team, Zilia Harshita, Silvana, and we're happy to support you directly in a follow-up call. So don't hesitate to reach out to us in either English, Portuguese, or in Spanish. We're there for you. So more information is coming and you've got great resources in your team. So thank you, Juliana. John, what's next for, for airlines? Yeah, we're keen to see more airlines uh, sign the Buckingham Palace Declaration and make a, a public commitment. Um, we have 63 IATA airlines have already signed the declaration, representing over a third of global traffic. Well, global traffic as was in 2019. Uh, and, but we've only got one in the region. So we're really very keen to see if we can get raise that raise those numbers and get more airlines in the region, realizing that they have a part to play in, in stopping this crime. Airlines can start raising awareness of the issue today. Thanks to the Routes Partnership, we have the information on seizures and trends. We have all of the um, awareness raising tools uh, for specifically for airlines. Uh, we have A-modules, we have videos, we have uh, guidance manuals, all available on our um, uh, wildlife trafficking webpage at iarta.org as well as um, on the on the routes website uh, and the other thing which we think is key is to start building relationships with your enforcement lockdowns and loss of tourism revenue will see increased poaching and stockpiling enforcement authorities and air transport staff need to be vigilant as the flights begin to resume so there is no reason to wait the information and the awareness raising materials are already there what we'll be doing is contacting each of our airlines individually within the region over the next two months to provide information on how you can fight this crime. Uh, but feel free to contact me or with your, um, you know, your IATA, local IATA office. Um, one area that we're looking for a little bit of support, we're looking for some volunteers who would be willing to trial a new wildlife reporting app that would allow staff to report suspicious activity directly to enforcement. So again, uh, any volunteers to help us with that, that would be most appreciated. Thank you. And to volunteer, should they come to you, John? Yep. 
Excellent. So I'm hearing uh, three or four actions there people can take. One, they can sign the Buckingham P uh, Palace Declaration. Secondly, they can access and use the information and materials that are available on the Routes website. Uh, now is a really great time, thirdly, to start building those relationships with enforcement uh, before uh, global travel fully resumes. And lastly, uh, look for outreach from you or feel free to reach out to you, and in particular, if they want to um, volunteer for, for that app. Um, terrific, John, thank you so much. Um, lastly, on our panel here, I want to turn to uh, Bella Genta. Um, Bella, uh, many people on today's webinar, including myself, have thanked the U.S. Agency for International Development. I know the tagline is uh, from the American people uh, for USAID for your role in helping to combat wildlife trafficking around the world and especially in the LAC region. We'd love to understand a little bit more about how um, USAID sees its role in the region and why combating wildlife trafficking in particular in the private sector is so important to USAID's mission. Um, Bella, can you give us a little bit of insight? Absolutely. Thank you for that question. First, I'd like to say that on behalf of USAID, I'm honored to be here and extend the thanks back uh, to you, Richard, for moderating, as well as thanks to the other co-hosts and panelists joining us today. Um, for a bit of background and to get to your first question, my agency, the U.S. Agency for International Development, or USAID, is an independent agency of the U.S. federal government. Our core mission is to provide assistance and funding to programs and partnerships that help improve livelihoods and resilience across the world, um, not just in this region. This includes an, uh, working in a number of kind of strategic areas, such as global health, economic development, humanitarian aid, agriculture, environmental conservation, and in addressing climate change. We have 13 field offices and four regional programs in Latin America and the Caribbean, and we actively partner with host countries, non-governmental organizations, the private sector, and, and other stakeholders on targeted initiatives in areas like economic development, the reduction of crime and violence, civil society strengthening, human rights, and environmental protection. Combating wildlife trafficking, to get to your second point, is one of USAID's key priorities because the activities of wildlife criminal networks fuel global corruption, harm local communities, and, and the ecosystems they depend on, which I think we've heard a little bit from the background um, earlier. In this space, we, we really work to prevent poaching, strengthen legal systems, detect illegal wildlife products and marketplaces, reduce the demand for wildlife animals and their products, um, and support international cooperatives that work on these efforts as well. Um, USAID supports the route partnership because we realize the critical role that the private sector um, and private sector companies play in tackling wildlife trafficking. Uh, wildlife traffickers take advantage of transport supply chains and processes to move wildlife and their parts illegally, thus fueling the demand both in Latin America and the Caribbean and abroad. Uh, by reducing avenues for them to physically move their products, we restrict their ability to connect to downstream distributors and ultimately to consumers. Wildlife trafficking is an issue that knows no boundaries, geographical or institutional, um, and the successes in the framework that the Routes Partnership has developed through multi-stakeholder collaboration has been dramatic and one that USAID wishes to build upon with the private sector in this region specifically. We hope that by sharing the partnership and the resources available and those kind of mentioned by, by other speakers today, um, will enable you all to become familiar with the issue and its impacts on, on your company, as well as the impacts on the transport industry more broadly. The team here will provide many opportunities, I believe, over the next, the next few months for you to engage and USAID strongly encourages you all to actively participate. Um, but yeah, I, I hope that answered your question, and Richard, if not, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks so much, uh, Bella, that was great. Um, so we understand from you that USAID takes a keen interest in this because of the impact that this has not only on the environment and on the specific species, but also on the broader economic development of the region and its safety and security, uh, both for, um, uh, for, for countries and for transportation, but also for human health and, and human, um, human economic development. So thank you so much for, for all that you do at USAID and for all of the contributions that you've made. Um, I wanna kind of open up the conversation here a little bit more and pull in some of the great questions that we've been getting from the audience. Um, first, we've had a number of questions about the relationship between uh, COVID-19 and the ensuing global uh, economic slowdown or shutdown. Uh, and the trade in, in illegal wildlife. And I'd you'd love to hear from John and from um, 
Juliana about this, but also uh, Bella, if you have insights, um, and maybe Bridget, uh, if she if she wants to come back into the conversation, um, has has illegal wildlife trade gone up or down during the shutdown? Uh, John, you kind of alluded to that earlier, but uh, do you have any data on that? Yeah. Well, um, as far as I'm aware, what we'll see is that the, there's been less trafficking, but there's been more poaching. So um, you know, there's simply been less flights, and so therefore uh, there hasn't been so much movement. Um, so yeah, there will be a surge are predicted to be a surge when the uh, the flights return. Um, we have to also bear in mind that this isn't just related to illegal wildlife. This can be related to the smuggling of animal products in general. So bush meat as well, which we've seen quite widespread, which ha has this potential because it avoids the sanitary checks that are put in place. And that, unfortunately, we've seen um, where, where it's been studied, that there, there has been um, large volumes of, of, of meat found um, in, in particular in people's baggage. Um, as I mentioned before, our, we have an extreme vulnerability um, within aviation. And um, whilst there's a huge business drive for us to commence flight operations, uh, the prospect of future pandemics shouldn't be lost. We need to develop rigorous contingency plans that would prevent or slow the progress of pandemics in the future, because this will impact again our employees, our investors, our shareholders, partners, consumers, communities. Unlike other sectors, the air transport sector can actually do something to reduce the risks of pandemics. And we can do that by trying to get people to stop smuggling wildlife products and exploiting us. So that will lower our risks and lower the risks globally. So it's, there's, a, there's a business driver for us to be interested in what's been smuggled in, on our aircraft. Mm. So it, I know I know it's, it's very uh, by species and region about what's actually happening uh, in, in in respect to poaching and uh, trafficking, but overall, because transportation has slowed down, trafficking has probably slowed down, but poaching uh, has, has gone up. We can expect a surge. Uh, now is the time to act, and we can really try to get our, our ducks in a row before things reopen and, uh, and try to lock down any security risks that we might have uh, within our own systems. Um, Juliana, do you want to jump in here? Any, any thoughts on, on how you're seeing things from the airport's perspective? Yeah, I would just add something on, on the how the, those traffickers tend to operate, right? They adapt to the change we make uh, and then they, they change the routes, they, they change the way they operate. So I guess as we move forward uh, and, and we're seeing the increase in poaching those during this lockdown, as traffic recover, we need to also try to understand how they would try to adapt and, and, and to exploit the, the sector in this way because they are very smart and they are also always trying to uh, overcome uh, the barriers and, and the way we work. So something that we need to think as we, as we progress developing this resiliency concept of, of the sector, I would say. Great, thank you. Um, Bridget, if I could pull you back in, if you don't mind coming off, uh, back on the camera and off mute, uh, is there anything in the data that you would highlight that's different or, or maybe that supports what John and Juliana have said? Definitely we're seeing um, in the data, as John and Juliana have said, a decrease in um, kind of trafficking instances, seizures in 2020 with the decrease in air traffic as a whole. Um, we don't collect information on the poaching incidents. Um, if it's, up. Uh, it's not what the air seizure database is for, but um, we have also been hearing that kind of in our other um, talks with partners and uh, people on the ground um, doing combating wildlife trafficking that um, they expect to see that spike and we are um, kind of poised for it in the in the data collection side to see um, to see the spike back up when um, kind of air travel and general travel um, opens up again. Gotcha. While I have you, I do have two other questions for you. I think they're kind of related. Um, we've had a number of questions that are very specific to individual regions or or countries, like what's happening in Lake Titicaca in Peru. Uh, and also um, a note from somebody that there's no data from Bolivia in the dashboard. Uh, in, if, in the dashboard, is there more detailed data? Can people get stuff down at that kind of level, uh, like at, about what's happening in Lake Titicaca? Or um, how would somebody uh, provide information uh, to you, like on a country like Bolivia? Yeah, for um, what's in the dashboard um, is kind of a aggregate understanding of what is in the air seizure database. And for more detailed information, I would recommend reaching out to the Roots Partnership, um, kind of any of the um, organizations on the call today. And um, we are consistently collecting information and 
um, while it might not be on the dashboard, we would be happy to kind of provide more tailored, um, more tailored analysis of kind of wildlife trafficking in specific areas. Um, if if there if are people want to give you information, yeah, yeah if we, if we would definitely um, love to have more information in the RCJ database. Um, like I said, it's collected primarily from open source reported kind of public reporting, new uh, local reports, studies, annual reports. Um, again, I'd say we um, would be happy to um, kind of collect additional um, seizure data and reach out to, again, the Roots Partnership or um, myself to kind of coordinate integrating that into the air seizure database, both for kind of your understanding and so that it can, can inform the rest of kind of how we think about wildlife trafficking in the area. Terrific. We've got one minute left here and I want to try to get to two very important questions. Um, there's been a number of questions here about um, joint action and, and coordination with administrative authorities and functions that have, uh, that have authority over natural resources. And also some specific questions about guidelines for airport task forces to help co combat illegal wildlife trade. Um, John, John, Michelle, or uh, uh, Juliana, do you want to jump on those? Maybe Juliana, you first on yeah, uh, guidelines on the, for airports. Yeah. Yes, on the guidelines for airports, uh, we're going to be launching the handbook and the dedicated e-model. So if you want, we also have a, a task force. So reach out to us. We'll be happy to follow up on you. Great. And John, somebody was asking, do, are you looking for airport volunteers for the app? Or is it only for airlines right now? No, absolutely. Uh, airports and, and airlines, it's for, for all their transport staff. Um, but yeah, we, we're also um, in, in, in different areas of the world, we're dealing with partnerships with enforcement. And so dealing with projects where we can use digital intelligence in order to be able to try and uh, seize. So we, in, in a way, what we're looking at is using um, security images uh, in algorithms to look at um, automated wildlife detection, which is extremely exciting. Excellent. Thank you, uh, John. And I know um, my, for airlines should be in touch with you. Airports should be in touch with, um, with their colleagues at ACI. Um, we are at the top of the hour here. So I do want to thank um, our panelists, uh, John Godson from Mayada, uh, Juliana, um, <clears throat> from, from ACI, Juliana Scavuzzi from uh, ACI, uh, Corey McFarland from WWF, and, and Isabella Genta from USAID. Thank you guys for all of your support. USAID, I, we really want to thank you for all of your support. Uh, throughout this entire program at, at the Routes Partnership. Uh, there's a number of unanswered questions here that we didn't get to, but we will. We will get to them as we circulate these, um, these additional details and the presentation. So look for information on how to engage uh, with your airport authorities, with your airport colleagues uh, through ACI and uh, for, for airlines through IATA. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna also invite you, if you for those who of you who are airports and would like additional information, uh, we will be hosting a second webinar on March 2nd. Um, for, again, as I said, for airports. Uh, I've been Richard Crispin, your moderator for today's conversation. It's been my true honor and pleasure to be with all of you. Thank you all for joining. Thank you again to ACI World and to ACI Lock and IATA for producing today's webinar, to the Routes Partnership for all of its work in helping to coordinate and combat wildlife trafficking in the air transportation sector and the transportation sector generally across the world, and to the U.S. Agency for International Development for its generous support of this and many other programs. With that, we'll close our webinar. Thank you all so much for joining. Have a great day.